Uh, good morning and welcome to the 2019 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Gerardo Guadiana. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan and it's my pleasure to be introducing our panel, Soccer Analytics Shaping the Future of the Game, presented by OptiPro. Uh, our panelists today, Brian Bellello, President of the New England Revolution, Ben McCreel, Head of OptiPro, Christine Lilly, former US Women's National Team player, Isaac Guerrero, Technical Director at FC Barcelona Academy Schools, and uh, Paul Carr, Director of Development at True Media will be moderating. Uh, Grant is running a little bit late, uh, and he'll be coming in a second. Um, the panel will be 45 minutes long. There will be 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you have any questions, you can submit them on Twitter using the panel hashtag Analytics Academy. And Paul will be taking the questions that have the most mentions on Twitter. Uh, and with that, I turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Us uh, soccer people from Kansas all look the same, so I just filled in for Grant without any trouble here. <laughs> so, would you want to just kind of set the stage on the people on the panel and how they work with uh, youth soccer with data? So, just kind of run through everyone real quick. We'll start with you down at the end, Brian. Can you tell us just kind of how the New England Revolution Academy is, is structured and how you tie that in with you know the first team and that the front facing side that people are more familiar with. Yeah, sure. So pretty typical for a more international soccer club in terms of how we're structured with the academy, but very um, unique in the United States and how we do sports here. So uh, our academy is on site, our own club, our own coaches. We have five boys teams, under 19s, under 17s, under 15s, under 14s, and under 13s. Um, we pay all the expenses for the kids, we pay all their costs, all the travel, everything. So it's a free academy to play for if you can make the team. Uh, what we then do underneath that U13 level is we partner with a number of clubs in our area. And so we try and touch as many kids as we can at the younger level to understand you know, who are the up and coming players, who, who has the potential to, to be part of our academy. Uh, and then we have another program which is a more of a paid sort of camp program, but that's a, a way for us to reach the entire broader community in New England, we coach about 40,000 kids a year through those programs. So we really start really young with kind of working with towns, working with clubs, working with camp programs, all the way up to the very elite uh, free programs to, to drive players into our first team. Isaac, you work with Barcelona's football school. Tell us what that means and how that fits into the big FC Barcelona picture that we're familiar with. Yes. Um uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm working as a technical director in the football school. Football school is like the first stage in our academy. We have uh, 40 teams in the football school also. We have 17 teams in, in the youth academy. And also the football school is in charge of uh, all of our schools in around the world. We have uh, 48 schools with 600 coaches around the world, uh, uh, more or less 14,000 uh, players that are involved in these programs. And at the same time, I'm uh, I'm part of the methodology area and uh, Barca Innovation Hub area. And I'm very closer to my, my mates that are here. I don't know where, but they are here for the sports science department. I'm, I'm a coach. I'm not an expert in analytics, uh, but I'm doing, trying to, to help uh, with my point of view about methodology, about game idea. You know, where we have a different game idea in our club, and this is more or less the summary. <laughs> Christine, you're working with youth now. Tell us kind of what you're doing with them now and how is their experience different than what you had as a youth player uh, right. back well, in the 90s? Yeah. Um, well, I have a, a, a camp business that I work with, Mia Hamm and Tish Ventrini. It's called Team First Soccer Academy. So we travel around the country um, to teach young kids the game, share our passion for the game, our love for the game, um, and in the, in the end picture, learn how to be good teammates um, and grow as, a, as an individual person and as a player. So for me, when I look at what we get to do, we get to travel you know, around the country. I'm going to Iowa today for a camp, and I, was, I grew up in Connecticut, and I mean, I think there was like maybe a handful of camps that I could go to. Um, I think what these young kids have now is the resources to, to play. Um, they have coaches that know the game now, um, besides growing up in a time where people didn't really know much about soccer who were coaching you. Uh, so the resources out there for kids is incredible. I think the one thing that, hasn't changed from when we were grow all of us growing up, is just you have to work. If you want to be good, you have to put the time in. And I think that's what we try to share with these kids. Like, you have all this in front of you, but if you want to be a better player, get to the next level, you have to do the work. Right. And that's really important part about it. 
And Ben, so you're with OptiNow, you've worked with a number of clubs, for a number of clubs in the past in the youth stuff. Can you give us a snapshot kind of of where those uh, academies are on the English side and, and then kind of bridge how they using the analytics uh, to ideally transition toward the first team? Yeah, so I mean, I started working in um, a Premier League Academy 10 years ago. Um, and at that point, we were sort of um, probably four or five years into the, the data um, revolution in, in football. Um, we had ProZone at the time, cameras set up in, in the training ground uh, where we were tracking our under 18 team and our, our under 21 teams. So even you know 10 years ago, we were still doing a lot of data and analytics on certainly the kind of under 18, under 21 group. Uh, and tracking their performance, um, you know. Fast forward to, to 2019, um, you know that we have an extensive coverage now of youth, youth soccer around the world. Um, we're working with governing bodies and leagues um, to track their youth development and, and how the players are coming through their academies and their systems. US soccer is a great example. You know, we're tracking nearly 2,000 games a year um, across the US uh, from under 15s upwards on both the men's and women's side. Um, all channeled towards player development and, and trying to track their progress. So it really has escalated very quickly in, in youth football as well as in, um, in the, the sort of senior game. Yeah. Kind of transitioning toward some of the recent changes we've seen in youth soccer and such with an eye on analytics. Uh, Brian, you, you touched on how MLS academies are kind of unique, both in the soccer world and kind of in US sports world. Uh, T tell me about the, just that different way of thinking that you have to have to approach it being in a different situation. Yeah, I think there's, there's two things. A, a lot of times you're playing competition that are, that are private, for-profit club, and their focus a lot of times is, is winning. And so the way they approach the game, the, what players are putting out there, the tactics they're employing is they're trying to win a game on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, and I think the MLS clubs, again, more similar to an to a, a international model, we're trying to develop the players. We don't really care if we win or lose a match. We care about you know, certain things tactically or technically. We're trying to do with each of those players in the squad. So it's hard sometimes when you're, when, you're, when you're in those environments and you're trying to do things. When we play other MLS teams, when we go to some of the tournaments, that's where you can open up a little bit more and you see the other teams are doing the same thing and, and it's a, just a better learning environment for the players. So I think for us, a data perspective, we look probably a little bit more um, physical data, technical data on the players than we do tactical data. I think when we go to the first team, uh, and our analyst Tim who's here today, um, he did a lot of tactical work with the first team, scouting our own team. So I think when you get to the academy levels, we're looking at more of that technical data and we're trying to understand who's most likely to develop, who's most likely to be able to make that jump, and then how do we give incremental experiences to those players, even if they might not be our best player today, if we're projecting them up maybe that's the player we pull in and send them to Florida with our first team like we did last week with a handful of our guys. So it's not always necessarily your, your best player, but it's the players that you're projecting to maybe have a better ceiling. Ben, so Ben, following up on that, how have you seen these clubs use some of this data? Because you know, on one hand, you're evaluating your academy. On the other hand, you're trying to integrate them with the first team. Those aren't always no. on the same page. Have you seen that interaction? Evolve? It's really difficult. Uh, it's a really difficult problem for, for academies all over the world. Um, because if, if you get one player per age group per year who goes up and, and could be a first team player, so if your uh, under 21s team in Europe um, is developing players, if you get one player who plays in the first team, you've probably done really well, um, which means you have potentially 22, 23 players in each age group that aren't gonna make it. So from an analytics perspective, you're, you're looking at a really small sample size anyway of games and, and, and players, but then also you're only probably looking at one player for your team who's gonna make it. One of the biggest challenges I think academies have is, is that problem of the competitive balance versus the ability to develop players for your team. Ultimately, you're channeling money into your academy to develop players for your first team, for your success. Um, but actually, 90, five to 99% of your players in each age group are gonna leave your club, um, and probably you're not gonna make any money from them. So from an analytics perspective, it's a really difficult job to kind of not only project talent, but also know what to do with the 99% of players that you know aren't gonna make it. Um, and I think what a lot of clubs are doing now is, is trying to look at the, um, the whole player. It's interesting, Brian talks about the, the different data points that we're looking at. You know, trying to look at, can we make this player the best player he can be 
in his career personally for him. If he goes and plays three leagues below where we play now, then if that's his ceiling, then that's, that's fine, but we're developing the best player we can have. The problem is that at the board level, at the financial level, they don't really care about that part of the, the right. group. They care about the 1% of players who are gonna make it and have success. At, at Barcelona, I think, you know, if you're a soccer fan, we've seen videos of whatever, eight-year-olds that are even before La Masia, and it kind of looks like they're playing Barcelona football as we think of it. So how do you kind of integrate that at even at that young an age and then keep it consistent, that style, those characteristics yeah. as you keep moving up the ladder in the Barcelona system? Yeah, we, we have an, uh, an advantage. Of course, I know that uh, many teams around the world, they are sharing the same idea from the first team for, to the academy. But maybe the difference is that in, in our club, we spent the last four years, um, we, we, were, we are very loyal to our idea, the last 40 years, and the last 25, 30 years uh, since arrived our, to our club, Johan Cruyff, that he spread all of this idea to the Jordan Academy, and we are following this idea. For the reason, when Akita entered in our academy with the eight years old, and uh, he will grow up in our academy, when he arrived to the first team, it will be very easy, very easy, because we respect the same, this uh, location game idea, the Akarity says our game, it's a very specific idea, a very inter, um, particular interpretation of, of our game. But in this sense, I remember the, it's an, uh, an anecdote that when I arrived to the first team, Martí Riverola is not a famous player, but it's a player that, who, who was playing in, in Italy and you know, in other countries. And he arrived uh, to our school with six-year-old football school. He passed all the teams and he arrived to the first team in 2011 in a, in a Champions League game uh, against uh, Bate Borisov. And he was in the warm-up in this moment before his debut. And uh, arrived the fitness coaches, uh, fitness, fitness coach, and, and asked to, to him, okay, Marty, are you, are you ready? Ready to enter to the field? And his answer was a philosophical answer, was that I, like, uh, I, have, uh, I have preparing for this uh, moment, I have been preparing for this moment all of my life. And this is true, because this guy, when I arrived to our club with eight years, he started to, to, to work with the concept, the principles of our game idea, location game idea, the same methodology, the same procedures, possession games, rondos, and when he arrived to the first team, it's something natural. Uh, one week before, he was uh, playing with the Barca B, the second team, and it's the same concept that he will need to, to, has a good, uh, to have a good uh, performance in the, in the field. The only difference is that one week before, he was uh, in front of 1,000 people, and now he's in front of <clears throat> 100,000 people. The, it's, it's something natural mm -hmm. that we respect and we believe. It's not the best idea, it's not the worst idea, but it's our idea. And for this, it's very natural, the, the process. No, nowadays, I think in the Champions League, we are the team with more players in the, in the lineup. We have five starters, the same number than Ajax, but it's, a, it's our idea, yes. Yeah. So, Christine, you're working with kids in different ways. Like you're not around them 24-7. You're more parachuting in and out and things like that, almost, almost kind of like in a national team sense, we see coaches work them. So how, in the limited time, and knowing that you know, you're not coming back to these kids again and again, how do you kind of instill these training techniques and concepts that you're trying to get across, but you only have you know, a day or two or an hour or something right. like that? Well, I think that that's the interesting part um, with our academy that we travel around and do is we, in the short amount of time we're with the kids, we're trying to give as much as we can um, to them. And our big thing about this is we, we share the, um, how we play the game now with our coaching. So we show them how much we love the game. We show them how competitive we are through our coaching. Um, we show them that we have fun um, and you have to work hard. And our Team for Soccer Academy, it's broken up into three parts. Um, the first age, or be a personality. So Mia was the <coughs> biggest name personality in uh, women's soccer and you know she she heads that day off and we teach the kids to be competitive all you want to do is sh shine be yourself be competitive go at defenders try to beat them and then the second day is be a playmaker and Tish Ventrina and I are we're both midfielders and playmakers um, in that and then the last day is to be a factor so we have those three components and within that we're teaching different parts of that game to them and hopefully when they leave there they have those three things in their head so we're out they're out on the field and they're playing and things may and go in with like oh i need to be a personality you know i need to you know go at them or oh am i not being more of a playmaker am i not sharing the ball am i not finding a player in am i and then lastly 
are you giving that last effort? You know, are you are you slide tackling to save a goal? Are you, you know, hustling to get a ball when it goes out of bounds? So, trying to instill all those kind of mindsets to the players um, to remember when we're not there. And obviously, the technical part is there as well. But we really want them to leave with something uh, that's a part of us. And our last message to them is always. Uh, put your team first. So that's how we got the name Team First Soccer Academy. We trained individually to be the best players that we could be, um, but in the same sense, we were training each other to be the best. And that's how I think the US was so successful because we were individually being the best, but if I wasn't giving my 100%, Mia wasn't gonna get any better that day. And if she wasn't, then I wasn't. So we show the kids that it does matter what, how you train, how you push each other, and, and what you do for the team to be the best it could be. So then on top of that, the as the mental side that you're trying to instill in your academies, Christine, and, and clubs are trying to instill. What uh, what sort of numbers are teams generally looking at to find their success for the club levels? And we, we know some of the key indicators. I think maybe at a top level, what's different about how they look at the numbers for for youth teams? So I think having watched a lot of um, European youth soccer, um, and I'm sure it's the same same here. Um, it's very possession based. So actually. The no youth, matter the youth teams are possession. Youth based. teams oh. are possession. Youth football generally is very possession based. So, no matter the style of the first team, you know, uh, if it's Barcelona, um, if it's one of my old teams, Burnley, slightly more long ball, direct. Actually, if you watch their academies, they, they generally have a lot of the ball, which makes it very difficult then to to look at that data and say, well, actually, he projects to be a possession player because actually they all do. Um, so one of the things that you have to do is almost kick out that sample and say, what does he do efficiently? If you're, not everybody, unfortunately, is gonna be able to play for Barcelona and play in that possession style. So if we're not, if we don't play like that, if, if we're not gonna be able to do that, but our games are very much structured around playing possession, because generally at that um, age group levels, there's not as much pressure on the ball, uh, def defenders don't get quite as tight, there's not quite as much pressing. So players generally have more time. So one of the things that, that I've always looked a lot at is just the efficiency of players. And it's sort of uh, indicated towards how quickly they can make decisions. So when they do go up into senior football and play under a lot more pressure, can they still be as effective? Can they still create as many chances? Can they still um, be as efficient with their passing and move the ball as quickly? Um, because you don't necessarily see that as much in the youth game. So I think that's one of the things that you always look at as a starting point, you look at the, the style of the game, the style of the teams, the style of the league that we're looking at, and use that as your starting point, and then start to look at how efficient the players are within that. Um, and then how would they project to go and play in leagues that aren't as possession-based? Brian, what other sort, you touched on this a little bit, what other sort of objective type of things are you looking at uh, for guys coming up through your academy? Yeah, I, I think the, the one important thing is with academy players, you're, you're always looking at vectors. You're always looking to see, like, which, which progression are they making? Where are they progressing? Where are you trying to get them to progress? And what, what things are progressing, right? When you're, when you're signing a 27-year-old player, you, you're looking at data to know who he is, what's the style he likes to play, how he reacts in certain types of situations. With a young player, you're trying to see, are they, are they growing in ways that you're trying to get them to grow? And what I always find fascinating is that how much of that is intrinsic to the player and how much of that can be taught. And I love Christine's opinion on this too because you might have fullbacks that like to go forward and get into the attack. And you might have fullbacks that defend more. And the question is, you know, when they're 14 years old, if you're teaching them, you need to go forward more, you need to go forward more. Now, if they're just not good enough, right? If they don't get to the point where they're a pro, okay. But, you know, what are those parts where like certain players just like certain things, feel right to them as a player, and other things you can teach them. And I think that's a fascinating thing for me is that now that, at least in MLS, we're investing in, you know, when you have a 13-year-old player who's a really good player, we're thinking about what do we need to do to make him a professional player. So if he's a center back, we want him passing out of the back. And guess what? At the U14 level, that's ugly. <laughs> it, it just yeah. is, right? Yeah. Like, they're going to give the ball away, you're going to score, but you're not going to tell the kid, stop passing the ball, hoof it up the field, because that's not going to help him become a pro when he's, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. So I, I always think, of, I, I always kind of wrestle with that. How much of that can you say, this is a style you want to play, and how much of that style is intrinsic to, to a great player? So I'll, I'll ask a great player and how she feels yeah. about it. 
Well, I think it, it comes down to when you look at different things that you want to do with the style, it comes down to the technical part of the game if they're able to do these things. And I mean, everything, it seems like everything with kids these days, we're, we want them to learn so much so young when I think there's definitely a progression that they need to, to learn. And, and um, you know, I was, uh, left, I was lefty, so I was put on the left side because you don't get many people like that. Right. And I was there, I had her there. I played left midfield and I could run, so I was not stuck there, but that was the best spot for me. I could also play forward as well. So I think coaches have to see, you got the strengths, but I'm on the left, and then you got Mia in front of me, you got Michelle Akers in the center, you got Brandy behind me, so. That was a pretty good team. That was a pretty good team. <laughs> <laughs> and you got Julie Fowley in the middle, Carl Overbeck in the center, you know, so as, Individually, you're trying to train these players to be the best, and then you have to put the team together. So, yeah, maybe I could score goals, but is me a better choice there? Ended up, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, but so you have to see the positive. And I think what makes, when you're picking players to be at the highest level, they have to have something special. Right. They have to. Barcelona, you can have, you know, 100,000 kids that could pass a ball within, you know, five to 10 yards, but they're always messy. He's gonna be special. He's gonna show you, you know, what he's got. You know, so I think there's always that little thing that you see something very unique about a player, whether it's really just guts and can win a head ball, or you know what, they they may not score, but she, every time like, if she gets the ball, she's gonna find someone's feet. So I think in the end, it really comes down to their technical abilities to be able to do these crafts, then something special that takes them to the level that not everyone gets to. As, how do you balance in, in the football school kind of or talk about training these kids and making uh, them better, but also uh, fitting that, or trying to get them better and pick out what they do well, but also fitting that within the concept of the team. So you, you know, you're trying to make this team, even at a youth level, better. We also want the players to develop the skills, mm -hmm. and sometimes those things are different. How do you, you balance mean in, that? Individual, individual uh, yeah, attention at, for the yeah, at that yeah. young age. <clears throat> I, I agree with, with you because I think that the, this new paradigm um, requires to, to change the, the point of view. I mean, uh, that maybe it's more based on knowing your player than knowing the game. It's more important to know the profile of your player than to know the, the, the principles of the in our case, the location game idea, in other cases, the long, uh, long ball or whatever. When, I, when I'm speaking about to know my player, it's not only to, to try to help him, of course, uh, to improve their, their skills. For me, it's very important to start our intervention, or more than intervention, our exchange with the player from the naturalized behavior of the player. And I will use the exercise to constrain the emergence of a new behaviors in this player that maybe will very close to our game idea. But for me, we have to, to overcome, or we have realized, the people that we are involved in the, this world of the training formation with the young, people, the young kids, that we are in, a, in, front of a different, in front of a different sport. Uh, football is uh, the most complex sport, in my opinion. And for this reason, maybe requires a different type of approach to the player. Uh, maybe it's more based in the individual skills, but in, in terms of um, the, the needs that he has, the individuality, uh, more based in the constraints, in the modification of the tasks, of the procedures, more than the verbal instructions, this explicit learning, this all, all around of this, uh, this idea. But for me, it's very important, first of all, to know the, the profile of your player, because, of course, will be the, the main tool to train. If you want to, to promote in this play, it's a, it's a simple uh, example, that this player will start to do a guided controls. You can put a con, pass, guided control, pass, guided control. But we are in front of an, a, a complex sport. It, it doesn't make sense. Maybe it will be more useful if you are, your skills are more in relation with a very dirty defender, very, um, that, that you never slow down the actions. I will put inside, in front of Isaac, and will emerge from me, naturally, this guided control and other skills that we can promote. It's very really important for me to start from the naturalized behavior of the player, yeah. So Brian, what's, oh, so good, I, yeah. I, just, I think that presents an interesting problem from an analytics perspective, just one of the things Brian mentioned as well, is at the senior level, when we're looking at elite players, if they continually make errors and continually are unsuccessful in their actions, then we would criticize them. We would, from an analytics perspective, we would say, 
poor performance, you know, can't, can't pass a ball into the final third success, successfully. But actually, at the youth development level, when we're looking at players, we probably actually want them to continually make mistakes. So if we're, we're looking at success rates of uh, just using simple things like passing, then actually, when that 14-year-old plays out from the back and continually gives the ball away, that's actually not a negative thing necessarily. If they, can, if they make small strides in their success rates over two, three years or, or whatever, but they continue the volume of, of times that they're trying that, that's a, that's a positive. So we do have to look at the game completely differently from a data perspective um, when we're looking at youth and senior football. Yeah. So, so Brian, I mean, it's, it's easier at a place like Barcelona where the philosophy is pretty consistent and even when you change coaches at the top, it's still Barcelona and they're, and they're playing that way. Hi, Grant. Hey. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Glad My apologies. <laughs> Good to see you. Weather delay this morning. That's Thanks all right. to the great Paul Carr for... I mean, in a pinch. Yeah. They just put us Kansas guys are all interchangeable. So. Exactly. So. All right. Well, I'll let, we'll we'll uh, let you jump in. I mean, feel free to continue, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I'll we'll, try we'll rope you in, too. And chime in with what you're up to. So I think what I was kind of asking Brian is, so Barcelona, it's, it's easier, I think, to have the consistency all the way down, even if, as you're changing in management. Brian, you had a coaching change in the last couple of years. How does that affect kind of the structural philosophy and analysis that you're trying to do as you get deeper when something changes at the very top. Speaking all the way down to the academy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we always try to be focused very much on sort of the technical skill base of that academy player, because you're right, that, that, that can change to a degree. And I think when you're an MLS team, you know, when you're Barcelona and you're, I'll, tell, I'll call them the best club in the world, when you're the best club in the world, you can dictate a lot, right? You can dictate the exact type of players you're going to get, the exact type of players you want to have in your academy. Um, but we just signed a uh, kid named Justin Rennix from our academy who, who knock wood, will, will be going with the U20 team uh, to the World Cup. Um, you know, if Justin's a great player, we, we're going to take him and we're going to develop him, right? And if he's not exactly the style that our current head coach has, we can't afford to say, well, he's not our style, so we're not going to invest in that type of player. So you really are working on that technical aspect of the player, trying to make them the best player they can get, trying a little bit of that, but that real club philosophy from a tactics and it doesn't really come into the 19s, maybe, maybe a little bit with your 17s. At the younger age groups, you're really just trying to get their technical skills up. And, you know, like I said, when I, when I talk about passing out of the back, that's not strategic, right? You just you want center backs that can pass the ball. And at a young age, you're just going to encourage them to do those types of things. You want to try final, final third entries. I don't know a club in the world or a coach in the world that doesn't like final third entries, right? So you're going to teach that. And, and again, I think Ben made a great point. You're not going to criticize the failures as much, but you want to make sure that they're good decisions, even if they don't pull it off the right way, and then make sure that, that they're growing in those stages. So I think from an academy perspective, the younger you go, the more technical and the less tactical you have to be. And I don't know, does, does Mbappe meet? Can he work play for any club? I, th I think so. He may not be perfect fit for every single club, but I'm not sure there's a lot of clubs in the world that could say no to a a player like that, right? So as you're developing young players, you know, we're, we're getting one to two kids a year out of our academy, right? So if we get to the stage where MLS teams are able to pump out six and seven professional level kids out of their academies, then maybe you'll see more player movement at the academy level. But right now, um, I think the numbers you're developing in the United States, it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to that. So, so Ben, how do the teams then kind of use the data to figure out, are you fitting a player into a system or kind of system around a player sort of thing as they're, as they're coming up there? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've done a lot of work on from an academy uh, sort of player development perspective is, is to profile players against players in history. Um, so we've got such a, a large data set now um, on players, not only from a, a senior perspective, but also now we're starting to get a decent sample size of youth players. Um, and we can start to look at this, you know, Frank Lampard looks like this at 21 when he was coming through into the Premier League, into West Ham, and then into Chelsea. Um, and we have a player in West Ham's academy, for example, who is 17, 18. Um, we've got enough data on him from three or four years. How does he compare to, to Lampard? Because they're similar types of players. And that's not necessarily just coming from the data, but actually the coaches are saying there's a lot of similar traits and there's a lot of similar characteristics that this player has to a player that we had who went on to be very successful. 
Now, we know players develop at different rates. We know that they develop in different ways. Um, but if we can identify what those characteristics are and that those, there are similarities, we can do a lot of, we spend a lot of time doing sort of similarity analysis and clustering to, to say, these players have these types of characteristics. And if they go on this age curve, they continue on the curve, then they could project to be, to be very similar. But as we know, there's a lot of error in that because of the, the different, even just personalities, body shapes, physical development that goes into that. I would ask also, too, in terms of what are the specific characteristics that you might see data-wise in a young player that you, the data would be required to help see that you might not notice with the eye? Yeah, that's, that's tough to say. I mean, I think, um, I think it was just one of the things I said before is, is around the efficiency of decision making. Um, I think often, uh, as, as I was talking about earlier, you know, the, the possession-based game at, at that level means that often players have a lot of touches and they're, they're involved a lot. Um, so actually, can you identify how efficient their decision making is? How quickly do they move the ball through them? You know, how, how quickly do they find a, a teammate in a forward position? Um, how much time do they spend on the ball in the final third? Are they able to make that quick decision and play a pass through and create a chance on the kind of at a very good ratio of, of times that they're in possession in that position? Um, so I think it is that efficiency of decision making because of the volume of, of involvements that players have at that level compared to um, when they step up to senior level and can they then make that transfer of being as efficient with less opportunities? I, I think one area that we're, we're not there yet, but is, is interesting for, for me at least, is, is sort of cognitive ability. And so when you see a finished professional player, you're seeing the, the, the culmination of their athleticism, their, their, their learning of the tactics and technical aspects of the game, and just their innate cognitive abilities, you know, decision making, digital spatial acuity, things like that. And so for young players that may be developing certain skills at different speeds, um, how can you start to really think about that so you don't have a player that might be a little behind the curve athletically? And when I say behind the curve athletically, there could be a kid at Barcelona that's behind his own personal curve athletically is still an amazing young athlete, right? But cognitively is super high on the scale and makes really good decisions, right? And so I think you see all the time players that you look at that athletically and technically are the same as many other players, but one of those players is world class and one of them is playing in the second division. And a lot of that's, I, th I think, between their ears, right? And the way they see the game, the way they visualize the game. And I think there's, at a young age, you can train some of that up and you train it by playing, but there's also, just like athleticism, I think there's, there's built-in abilities there. And I think the more we can see that, understand that, the less likely we are to kind of skip over a young athlete that has maybe more mental side than physical side at a certain age, right? And, and those things are not always in line the same, same way. So I think that's a whole aspect that we haven't really touched on yet, but I think it's a, a space that there's a lot of ability to, for at least people who have academies to look at. One of the uh, things we had at our event a couple of weeks ago was actually one of the sports science staff from, from Barcelona who presented um, body orientation um, and, and the effect of that on, on decision making. And again, that's one of the things we have a real problem with with the data, is that actually, you know, we can say, well, he should have completed more passes, or he should have had that shot. But actually, we don't know what he could see. We don't, you know, that pass was behind him, and he couldn't see that. He was under pressure from here, so, so we don't know that that was there. So there are still limitations in the data, because as Brian said, the difference between a, a League Two player and a Premier League player is probably not enormous technically, but it is that ability to make decisions. But with the data, we don't know what they can see. We don't know how they're making those decisions. And I think the advancement in those types of technologies are going to help us evaluate that in a better way. And, and even more, um, I totally agree. Even more, also, the, uh, the things maybe we are working in, in, a, in a project to identify the, the, the feelings of the possessor of the ball, the feelings of the possessor of the ball, linking these feelings with the behaviors of the people, of the players that are in the mutual help space, uh, the, close to the ball. Uh, we divide the spaces in three levels. Intervention space, I am with the ball, and my direct opponent. The second level, these behaviors. And maybe with this, we try to, to help the player to identify himself, the, the feelings. And when he identifies through this uh, declarative learning, we can train these kind of behaviors 
to promote the immersion, natural immersion in the player. It's like a, a somatic marker, okay? And, and we try to do to improve this decision-making system because I, I repeat, uh, um, we are in front of a different sport. Um, and this sport needs, for example, the body orientation to take in, uh, to, uh, to consider. It's not possible to reduce the, this data to the same levels that in other sports that you don't share a space, like tennis, volleyball, or maybe a sport that you share the space, like handball, basketball, but you never have players in, in your back, for example. And this sport, in my opinion, is not the best sport and it is the worst sport, but it's, the, in my opinion, the most unpredictable sport, the most chaotic, the, the, the sport with a higher degree of uncertainty for two simple reasons. First of all, because the technical action is done by a non-dominant limb, legs, and also this non-dominant limb, limb that is in charge of doing the technical action is in charge of moving the body through the space. With this, you, you don't have time to, to perceive, analyze, and decide. You have to react. And to react, you have to flow, to use this implicit learning, to use this uh, instinct, this intuition that many times we put in relation with the DNA. And I think that we can train this. And we can analyze, but with another data. Christine, how do you teach decision making? I mean, it's, it's obviously, you know, it's tough, it's tough to quantify at times. So how do you go about uh, kind of trying to sh show them or teach them how to do things right. that are a little more well, intangible? Like I think a lot of that is instinct. Um, and I, we were talking earlier before um, these age young kids in whatever sport they're playing, uh, they go to practice and they wait for someone to tell them what to do. They wait for this, they wait for that. And... Um, I don't know if majority of us, but a lot of us in this room grew up in a time where we went out and played pickup. Whether you're playing pickup basketball, pickup soccer, baseball, you're making your teams, you're making your boundaries, you're making this, and you're making your decisions already. So I think um, teaching that is difficult. I think they have to be in scenarios that their mind has to think, and you can't think for them. So. Um, you know, like the, I see the kid, I go to the practice and the girls are kicking the ball and then they, they look at me and then they see them like, well, when are we gonna start? And I'm thinking, well, let's do something, you know? So I think we have to give them an environment where they can start to use their brain themselves and make decisions. And from those mm -hmm. decisions, they see whether the decisions are, are good ones or bad ones. And obviously you can create, I mean, drills, whatever, playmaking drills, you're in the center of the midfield, you get a ball and you gotta either turn, face, you know, there, there's all scenarios you can create for that. But I think in the beginning for the young youth kids, they're not thinking, they're being told. So we have to give them an environment where they have to start to think. And I think that'll start to change the mindset um, of their creativity of players. Um, the ones that are already pretty good at it, they're gonna be better. The ones that don't have a clue, will maybe start to have a little bit of a clue. But along the lines when you guys are talking about the measuring that last piece, you can't, measure, you can't measure heart. You can measure your heart rate, and you can see how, how fast my heart's going, but in the end, if I'm picking a team, I, and we're at the national level, top players in the world, you know everyone's good, so we're, how are you deciding who you're picking on your team? I'm going with someone that's gonna work their ass off for me, you know, and I know that, and, and that's the part, I think, where the data and all that is there. But now, what do we do with that? And how do we still, how are you still the best player? You're so good, but why are you better than me? Just a little bit. And I think that comes within from inside, um, inside your heart and, your, and the mental. And that's a big part that you do train that as well, but it's, it's hard to keep that data on that. <laughs> I mean, just as a follow-up on that, Christine, I used to cover basketball in a before I went to full-time soccer. And here in the US, there have been these complaints that our basketball players, especially true 10 years ago, that they play too much street ball and don't learn how to play the game. But then I was covering the soccer side and they were saying, well, we don't have enough street soccer. We should be more like Brazil. And it made me wonder, like, how do you reconcile those two things? And where does soccer fit in in that? In your, well, I, th I think that is a, that is a balance. And I think um, 
raining in the street is easier than bringing the street to the, you know, to the structured environment. So I think, you know, the soccer's missing that creativity. The basketball, they've had too much of it. So you can guide that, I think, a little bit easier than you can create a creative uh, atmosphere for the kids. So um, that is a balance, and that's a balance with everything, dude. It's, it's a balance with picking the players. You know, how do you, like, well, we have these five are really fast and can score goals, and then how do we balance to find someone that's a little bit more playmaking and have a little more balance? So it's interesting, but I really think you, the creative part, I think if it's already there, that's a bonus, and then you can narrow that to fit into your team uh, concept. But creating the, um, not having the creativity and is something we got to figure out because we're missing it on these young kids, mm. I, I think, right now. I, I um, think that, sorry. I touched on earlier, too. I, I think in the U.S. with soccer, when you have these for-profit clubs that are trying to win, I, mm. I think you get too focused tactically at a young age versus technically. What you want to see is, you know, I want to see, well, for us, like, at young ages, we want to see players take players on. And they might fail and turn over the ball, and the other team comes down and scores, but we're not going to tell that player, don't do that, right? But if you're interested in your club winning the U14 Northeast Championship, whatever thing, you're going to tell that player, get rid of the ball, don't do that, don't, don't be in that environment. So I do think the, the system in the U.S. Has, has put us in this spot to a degree. And so when, when you have your goal is to develop players and not to win games, then all of a sudden you think about it a little bit differently. And, and I'm not saying that we always get the right balance or any club gets the right balance, right? But you're at least trying with a goal in mind to develop the player and not to to win the game, and so you're giving them probably a lot more freedom and flexibility to, maybe not all the way to street ball, but at least to, to let that creativity out. Then what's next uh, from kind of a data analytics, technology, whatever standpoint for uh, just working on the, with these youth teams over the next five or 10 years? You know, just we're well, spitballing yeah. a little bit, but what, uh, what do you see on the horizon? I mean, it's probably not even um, spitballing, to be honest. We've just created a partnership with a company called Rezzle, who um, do virtual reality. Um, and that's, that's, when we're talking about decision making, it's, it's really interesting. This company have built a VR system, and I know there's, there's many others, um, but they've built these games actually within the system. So you, you, you have youth players put on a headset and they're in a, a tactical drill. Um, so they have, they have to check their shoulders, they have to count how many players are on each shoulder before a ball comes towards them, they have to pass it into a goal. So actually, and that's for both player development, it could be for injury recovery, it could be for national teams when uh, they're spread out all over the country and they can't get together regularly, they could all set up these games through VR, um, which, is, which is fascinating. It then imports um, both uh, event data and, and tracking data to recreate a game. So you can put a player into any scenario from a previous game, um, put him into any player on the pitch, and they can then see what, they, what that player saw as the game was happening. Um, it creates an interesting dynamic between players and coaches then, because the coach is saying, you know, you, you weren't in the right position, and then they go and look at the, the VR, and they, the coach puts the headset on and goes, oh, okay, actually, you couldn't see that because you were facing the other way. So even kind of right now, that kind of technology is advancing, and, and Rezal actually is um, invested in by Vincent Company. So you know, current players are, are very interested in that tech as well. And Brian, you're trying to measure different kinds of abilities that uh, the cognitive type of things, right? As you're, as you're trying to move forward to figure out better ways to do that for these kids too. Yeah, I think there's, there's some stuff that we do um, in our organization, both on the soccer and the football side, that we've kind of learned from those type of skill sets and how do you, how do you develop them. Like, again, if you had a great player, it doesn't mean you're going to throw the academy player out because they're not testing well there, but um, maybe there's a player that isn't playing as well that's really high in those areas and you and you can work on their athletic side and, and see if you can bring them along knowing that if we ever if we ever get that above they're going to be a really smart player and maybe that's a player that can play in the middle of the park for you one day because they see the game at a level that maybe this really athletic winger is never going to see the game and it's great if you got this really great gifted athletic winger but if he always passes when he should shoot or if he always shoots when he should pass or if he always plays the wrong ball it doesn't doesn't really help you when you're out there in a real match so again i don't think we give up on players that wouldn't meet those requirements, but it's just, it helps you understand that there's a, there's a piece that can, because when they're playing a match, all that comes together in the performance, right? But if you can break it down, can you then train it? I mean, Rezzo, that's a great tool, right? That you can maybe look, work on certain things for a player that might be passing the bad situations, and do they need to be better at checking or getting a better feel for how crowded the spaces are in certain parts of the field? All right, we got Twitter questions coming in. So I'm gonna start, uh, I'll start with you, Brian. How much, 
do you, basically, how much are Academy of Kids aware of this data and analysis that's by which they're being judged, and how much do they care? Kind of, kind of, sort of <laughs> the same thing, but not necessarily. The Academy of Kids aren't, aren't aware of a lot of it, I would say. And the professional players, and I'll look at our analysts, I, I don't know, 10 to 15 percent maybe of the data that we track on our professional players even, that they're even aware that what we're looking at for them. So you're really trying to take the data as a coach, analyze it, and then come up with a plan for the, you know, at the academy level for that specific player based on the data. But I don't think you're, you're, you're it may just come as, hey, you need to, you need to take more guys on or you need to find the ball more in, 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 in the game, things like that. But you're not saying, you know, your touches per 90 aren't as, High as we want them to be. So I don't think you're doing it direct, but you're translating it into actions for the player. Ben, this is a very simple question that we talk about a lot in the U.S. Um, how can the U.S. men's national team compete better with top international teams? But more specifically, how, does, how do you see U.S. soccer using all this data that you've talked about to try and advance the, you know, the progress of the national teams? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the positive messages is that from everything I've seen in, in any country in the world, I think uh, what US soccer is doing for the betterment of the game, for the MLS, for development academies, but ultimately for the national team is probably one of the best structures I've seen. Um, and I think that the level of detail and, and tracking of these players is only gonna help because the problem that you have in the US um, is the size of the country and the number of players and the, the small pockets of this country that you, uh, it's difficult to track the, the players' development. So the fact that US uh, soccer are doing this um, means that they're, they're not gonna let players slip through the net, uh, which means you have a greater foundation of players and their development and being able to work with them on a regular basis um, to get them to the level that, that they can compete. Um, but the league's gonna help that as well. Uh, I think the investment that MLS is making now in young talent from around the world, as well as their own talent, and the structure of the salary cap and the structure of the league is all geared towards enhancing the, the league's success, but also the national team's success. So I think everything is there. Unfortunately, like Spain, uh, it, took, it took Spain a while to, to get what they've had in recent years, and that was through structure. Germany was the same. Um, the English FA have been trying it for a long time. I'm Welsh, so I'm, I don't care. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge, and, but it takes time. Um, but I think the foundations that US soccer have put in are, I say, one of the best I've seen. I do, I do in our league, you know, we, we, we recognize the, the need for youth development. So again, I think on, on long term, that's gonna really help the US national team because we're not gonna be a type of league that maybe, maybe in England they can afford to buy every single player they want anywhere in the world. MLS, certainly we're, we're buying some players, or we bought a Spanish player this year, um, but we recognize that we need to develop players for our league, and there's gonna be a knock-on effect, I think, for the national team. I mean, um, people talk about the league, and I know there's, there's criticism about the league generally, but it, it's a league that's really dedicated to, to the sport in the United States and trying to grow it, and, and I think the structure that we have allows us to invest in the league and in development, right? So like we just, we're building a $35 million training facility. I mean, that's for our first team, but it's also very heavily geared towards our academy. And you're not doing that unless you see the future of the sport and know that you have a role in, in developing. And I think MLS is gonna play a big big part in that because we can afford to and we, and, and we should. I actually think USL is a big part to play in this as well in, in terms of um, second teams. I think you look at someone like Barcelona uh, I spent a lot of time scouting Barca B when I was working for clubs because it's a fantastic environment for competitive, really, you know, Segunda football is, is tough. Uh, it's very high quality, but it's tough. And that's a great environment. And I, I think um, looking at the Red Bulls and, uh, and other teams that have got second teams in the USL, I think that's only gonna help the success because that is a massive problem that actually other European leagues, particularly in England, we have is that we don't have our under 21 players playing in competitive competitions, um, which is something that I think you know, USL could do and, and, and certainly that structure could happen here. I had a quick question for Isaac uh, about Barcelona. It seems like Spain on the women's side is getting better quite, mm -hmm. quite a bit in recent years. And I've been to Barcelona, visited, and uh, the women's side mm -hmm. on the development side seems to be growing as well, much more so than, say, Real Madrid. Mm. Um, what have you guys been doing on the women's side 
when it comes to identifying talent and figuring out where to go and, and how you decide what you're doing in that area? We don't have difference in, in, in terms of uh, methodology, game idea. The only difference is that three years ago, we established that our first team will be a professional team. And this is like a, we changed the focus for the young girls. It's not something that we are doing something amazing. No, we are so, doing something that's normal. That we have to normalize the situation because you know that in Spain it's not, it's not the same level that here in the US with the women's uh, football, unfortunately. But step by little by little, we are trying to arrive to this, uh, this, uh, this level. And I think it's nothing, nothing, it's very normal. It's only to, to put that the objective to normalize the situation. And of course, we have a first team, uh, men's teams, with a, with a professional team. It's a professional team and also in the women's team. And also take, taking the opportunity, if you, are, let, if you let me, about the, the U.S. soccer also. I have the, we, we have the common problems in Europe and U.S., practically the problem. And I will go uh, two or three steps behind. I think the most problem or the, the big challenge that we have is to change the role of the coaches. Because maybe here you have in a country with amazing uh, sports culture, amazing. But the problem is sometimes my feeling is that you try to translate the culture of basketball, baseball, uh, football to the soccer. For example, in terms of the relation with the, the coach with the players, uh, the orders promote this connection of this cycle, uh, perception, uh, intention, action. I'm saying that you have to do, you will do. But in soccer, it's not, it doesn't make sense. You have to reinforce this cycle of uh, perception, action, of sensation, action. And for this, the coach of the, the maybe the, 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 the coaches in the youth teams in soccer, they have to do one step behind the line, the touch line, sit down and promote an implicit learning, create context, uh, reinforce the naturalized behaviors. And with this, we'll increase a new generation that will be autonomous. We have to empower the player in US and Europe, around the world. But especially here, because we have the uh, great examples of basketball, but another sports, you use hands. All right, one more tour question, we'll throw this at Ben. What sort of uh, consistent or you know, specific stats tend to illustrate performance and potential? And this is kind of a, the million dollar question, <laughs> right, for these academies. Yeah, I think can you, you give us an example or two that, that you've seen uh, teams kind of utilize to try and be a little more predictive Track for the potential. young players? Yeah. I think our data scientists are sat at the back of the room. Whatever I say, I'm going to get criticized for right. um, it. Tom, Tom, straighten him out, will you? Yeah, Tom's at the back there. He can answer this. Um, yeah, that's really tough. I mean, I think if you asked any panel over the next two days in any of the sports, they'd probably struggle to give you a, a potential answer because predictive analytics is the hardest thing to do. Mm. Um, and particularly, as Isaac said, you know, in a, in a complex sport like soccer, it's so many factors affect performance. Christy knows this better than any of us. So many factors affect the decision-making aspect and, and the technical aspect of the game. Um, I think some of the metrics that we're starting to develop now, um, like expected goals, uh, like uh, you know, expected pass passing percentages and things like that, basically allow us to evaluate players' decision-making and, and whether they're making consistently the right decisions in those situations based on a huge sample of data and what we think the best decision is in that scenario. Um, so I think those are the, the metrics that uh, are being used a lot now to, to project a player's ability to, in the same situation, on multiple occasions, under similar types of pressure, they'll be able to make that, dis that correct decision. Um, Christine? Christine, how do you kind of identify the potential, uh, you know, beyond the numbers? If, if you're, like, you know, you have two, whatever, 13-year-olds, yeah. and they're kind of similar now. How do you, from a coaching standpoint, Well, I think, I mean, you look at, uh, I mean, body language is a huge, huge thing for me. I mean, you can have a set, talented players, and both these players take on, lose the ball. One player puts their head down, one player runs. That's one inclination. I'm going with this player. Um, so I think body languages, their character, how they treat their teammates. I mean, when you got talent here, then you got to look at the other aspects because they got to fit into a team component, and that's really the big part of it. You can be an amazing player, but if you can't fit in a team, you're not playing on a team. Right. Which is what your book's about, right? That's yeah. We just recently just finished a book with a co-author about uh, teamwork. It's called Powerhouse, and go. it's basically sharing stories of why the U.S. was so successful on the women's side, and bringing a team together to be the best. I think that'll wrap us up for the soccer panel. Thanks, everybody.